Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. It's all good. It's all good. So I, I just want to kind of kick back into where we've been. This is the third week. I'm talking about being a voice and not an echo. God has called us. He's commissioned us to take what we have and to share it with somebody else. It's not enough to just keep it. Imagine being the king of a great land and you have all the resources and all of your people were peasants. Everyone was a peasant. All were poor. All were struggling. The children were hungry. And you set up on a palace with all of this wealth and money and conveniences and, and provision and power and, and influence. And here you were, this guy. What kind of a person would you be deep in your heart? Would you know that we might be that king if we don't take what we have and share it with the peasants in this world? And I'm talking about spiritual people, right? Those that are lost without the Lord. People that don't know Jesus are peasants when it comes to spiritual things. They're poor. John, he, uh, in the book of John, God said, Jesus said to John, he, he, and he was speaking to uh, one of the churches, that it, it, the church itself, not just the lost, but to the church. He said, you guys are poor, you're blind, you're Amen. wretched, you're naked, and you don't even know that you are. Amen. That's a picture of the church that, that was out of order when he said that. But think how much more that applies to the lost that don't know the Lord. They've never had a revelation of who Jesus is or what God has done for them. They're poor, they're blind, they're wretched, they're, ne they're naked. They don't even know that they are totally in the dark and they need a voice to speak into their lives and say, there's a way out of this thing. There's a light in the tunnel. Now here's where the tunnel's at. Somebody's got to point the way for them, for them. And so God began pointing the way in the Old Testament through the prophets. All throughout the Old Testament, God spoke to mankind through his prophets. He would raise a man up, most of them from their birth, even if their ministries didn't start until later on in life, he would raise a man, he would call a man out from birth and raise him up to be a voice in his time. And there were, I said this last week, but there were seasons of silence where God would not speak. And he would always break the silence with a voice. You think about it. If you know that, if you're familiar with the different things in the scripture that I'm, I'm thinking of, you don't know what I'm thinking, so how would you know? Uh, we've just been reading through the Bible again this year, and we've been in the Old Testament a lot, and, and you, you start getting this broader picture of God's purpose for this whole thing and how it unfolded and how simplistic he was in delivering his message to people. God did not have a message that only the intellectual could accept and receive. Y'all know that? Amen. He didn't come out and, with, and, and you know, have orators and, and uh, professors and, and intellectuals and engineers and scientists and doctors and lawyers, thank God. And, uh, but he didn't come out with people whose vocabulary was above ours to speak to us. He used the common man. He called the common man. But then there were those at times who were highly educated intellectual people that he would use. But most of the time, God used a common man that he would anoint and put his spirit upon that guy so he could clearly communicate to God's people what he wanted to say. Do you know how complicated the message of the Old Testament was? Man. Can you imagine, do you, do you have any idea how complicated it was to follow God in the Old Testament? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to let you in on a secret. The Old Testament, there was one message preached, and that's all. What was it? Help me out, Barry. Y'all ready? The only message, for, you, you study the Old Testament, and all y'all reading through the Bible with us. The only message preached in the Old Testament was repent of your sins and your wicked ways and turn and follow God. That's what all the prophets said. Now, there were some prophets that would come along and give instruction to people. This is the way you need to go. Do this, do that. Don't do this. Tell them some specifics. You know, don't go down this path or the she bears are going to come out and eat you, I think, or whatever. You know, the, the lions will come out and get you or whatever. There, there, were some particular, there were some things that God spoke. But the message was very simple from all of the prophets. Repent of your wicked ways and turn toward the Lord, and I will forgive your sin. That's it. 
And you, get, and you have 4,000 years of that being proclaimed. 4,000 years of repent, turn, repent, turn, repent, turn. And then there would be seasoned in that. It was, th that message was seasoned occasionally, but not always, after it was proclaimed. It would be seasoned with, and God is, his mercies are new every morning. If you will turn, I will turn to you. And it just all throughout, you would see there was just a, just a little touch here and there of understanding that God's a good God and a loving God and a caring God. But the, but the, the forthright message of the Old Testament was God is a God of justice, a God of justice. In the Old Testament, I'm saying. So in the New Testament, he comes and he brings along a, a fresh revelation that is to complete what he started for the first 4,000 years. I love these little pictures and things that uh, we've come up with over the years. But when you look at the scale of time, say, say my hand is the beginning of time. And by the way, the beginning of time was 6,000 years ago for this earth. Now, God, may, there may have been, uh, uh, we don't know how long it was from when he said, in the beginning, there was light. And God began to create the things. We don't know how long it was after the earth was created before he put man here. But if, in, in its simple reading in the book of Genesis, you see very clearly that mankind has been on this earth for 6,000 years. And scientists can't, can't argue that. They come up with all this stuff. But anyway, uh, and so, but from the beginning of that time, God has always portrayed himself, tried to convey to, a man, to mankind that he cares about mankind. And out of his care, there has to be justice. If there is no just, a loving God will be a just God. He can't say that he loves you and not have punishment for, no, for those who would hurt you, right? He can't say that he loves you and not have a deterrent for us to not hurt others or to not do things that are wrong and immoral and that are destroying our own bodies and our own lives. If he loves us, he's going to do that, right? A loving father. Right, Hebrews talks about it. It says, uh, if a father loves his son, he disciplines him. And he even says, if he doesn't discipline, he's a bastard. That's right. And no, that wasn't a cuss word. That's an actual word. And I, that's what he says. If he doesn't love his son, he will not discipline him. God loves us until God disciplines us. But what does a father do before punishment? He warns. He teaches. He instructs. The first thing that we do when we're raising children in our, in our life, when, when we are raising our children, the first thing that we do for their benefit is to teach them and to warn them of what bad will do in their life, what evil will produce, what disobedience will bring. That's the first thing we do, right? And the whole time we're hugging them and loving them and kissing them and come to daddy and, and uh, you know, all the good stuff. We're doing all those things. But our instruction for life when children are young is don't, 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 don't. Right? Isn't that right? And if you're a child, you're thinking, why are you always telling me don't? You know? Why? And, 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 but it, that's the way it is. So the same way, in the, in the course of time, Here's your 6,000 you 6, years ago, Adam and Eve in the garden. You go 4,000 years of don't, 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 don't. And then there's the, the horizontal uh, of the cross, if you're with me, and 2,000 years on top. So you got 4,000 years and 2,000 years and you have a cross. Horizontal is when God came down and met with man. And at that point... He, be, he brings a new revelation. And it's not a new revelation. It's the old message unveiled to where man can now understand and see what was being revealed in the old. Y'all with me? You ahead of me? You should be ahead of me on this because you're all Bible scholars. So we talked about uh, Jeremiah. We talked about Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel's message that God gave him 
on that particular uh, message, that, well, that text that we read last week was real simple. It was this, go tell the people. He said, they, they've got deaf ears and blind eyes. They won't listen to you. But go tell them anyway. He said, go tell them. If they have been good and righteous all their lives and they've done right and served me all of their lives and now they start doing wicked, I'm going to forget all the good they did. Now, it sounds really harsh, but how, again, how are we as parents? You know, kids, you can have a great kid, and then he can do something really dumb and bad, and all of a sudden, the belt's coming out. And it's like, doesn't matter all the good you've done, boy, you should never have done that. <laughs> doesn't mean we don't love them. Actually, it implies that we do love them because we don't want them to do that again. It's kind of quiet in this Pentecostal, <laughs> Presbyterian Pentecostal church. But... Uh, but then God said there to him in Ezekiel, he said, but here's the other thing. He said, also, he said, tell the wicked, tell the wicked, all the wickedness they've committed, all the bad deeds, all of the evil, all of the rebellion, all of the turning away from me that they have committed all the way up to this moment, if they will turn and repent and do good, I will forgive the past and forget it. And he even says in another scripture, which you're familiar with, he said, I'll, I'll throw their sins as far as the east is from the west. Amen. We like that because yeah. if you go from north to south, you get there. <laughs> but if you go from east to west, there's no end to it. And so no matter how much bad we've done, when we repent and turn, he was saying to the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, if you'll just start doing right. That's all he asked them to do was to do right. Now, they were to offer a sacrifice because that was the way the law worked. But as far as God was concerned, just turn around and do right. At the end of the year, yeah, you can go get involved in the sacrifices or, or you can go take your sacrifice this weekend and go see the priest. Whatever, that's good. Do that. That's what I told you to do. But as soon as you turn, he said, I'm going to turn back toward you. And so that's the message of the gospel. That is the gospel in the Old Testament, Right? The Old Testament, the Old Testament was hard. It was hard. You better be careful what you did. If you were a rebellious child, the community would take you in the streets and stone you, right? If you committed adultery, both of you would be stoned by the husband of the woman and then the community if it was needed. Everybody would come out and grab. Any of y'all ever see that video, that, that movie that used to, it was a short clip famous video of this community that drew straws and once a year they stoned somebody. <laughs> You're a smart man. Uh, I don't even, this was way back before YouTube and it was just weird and at the end of it they stoned this person. That was it. Well, that's, it was that ruthless in the Old Testament. You know, a, a bunch of youths, 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 Say that word, use. Now, you guys from Chicago, up in New York had no problem saying that. Use. <laughs> a bunch of use come out, and they start making fun of the prophet, who's a bald-headed man. Yep. And they said, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And what, they were mocking him because they had heard in some form or fashion that he could go up like his predecessor was taken up in a whirlwind off the earth. And so they're making fun of, the, of this guy, Elijah, Elisha. They said, go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And the Bible says that God sent two she-bears. And you want a mean bear, you got to get a female bear. <laughs> a mama bear, yeah. Sent two she-bears out of the woods, and they killed, they tore to shreds 40 ewes. <laughs> This was serious stuff in the Old Testament. And you say, why would God do all that? Why would God allow that to happen? They're just picked. They're, they're, they happen now. I'm going to tell you, these, the Old Testament is 100% accurate and true. Noah's, Noah's Ark did happen. Uh, there was a great fish that swallowed, that swallowed uh, that guy. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego really were in the fire. Daniel did shut the mouths of the lion. These are true stories. These things really have, they're history. They're in history books. We'll believe anything in any history book unless it's the Bible. That's, that's, that's the world. And so the Old Testament was this 
this time frame that God took one, well, two-thirds of the time of him accomplishing all that he had purposed for this world and for you and I and our life in, in, in regard to eternity, he took two-thirds of that to, to straighten us out, to line us out, to say, get it right so that when you're an adult, you can prosper, child. This is what he did. And so, thank God we were born after, in, in the age of grace. Amen. Some of us would have been eaten by she bears by now. The way people trash pastors and preachers and yeah. and uh, right yeah. could have been not just that but anything and everything immorality. I mean, God was it was tough, and and what He didn't want was for His people to wind up looking like the nations that worshipped other gods. This this is the reason for the strict law in regard to the other nations that He said, "Go in and wipe them out, kill them, women, children, animals, beasts." everything. And you're like, what kind of a God does that? I'm going to tell you what kind of a God does that. These people were so immoral, they were killing and eating their own children. They were burning their children in fires to Moloch and, and Asheroth and all these different gods. They were ruthless. They were evil. In their, in their worship practices, they were orgies. I mean, they were so immoral and so out of line that that cancer needed to be removed from the earth before it literally came in and took over even the people that God has set aside to be his holy people. And it kind of was reminiscent of, of except the days be shortened, uh, even the elect would be deceived in our day. God has to do things to protect his people and to keep us out of that. And so he told the children of Israel, you guys are not to marry into these foreign religions. You cannot, or these foreign people, don't marry into, into their nations because you'll become like them. And they would do it and they would become like them. And they'd build high places and they'd build altars and, and they'd worship other gods. And then God would have to come down and to pull his people out aside and punish them and speak into their life through a voice. The voice that spoke into the people is the same voice that is speaking to us this morning. I don't want you to get this. The voice was not Elijah's tongue. It was not Moses. It was not David. You know, David was a prophet too. It was not Daniel. It wasn't Ezekiel. It wasn't Isaiah or Habakkuk or Hosea. It wasn't any. It, that was, they were not the voice. They were the mouth that the voice projected forth from. Because God would say to them, when I say to you, you say. He said to Ezekiel, go to my people and speak to my people. And then the next verse was, as we saw this last week, the next verse he said something like, so you tell them. No, no, he said, and I am saying, and he said what he's saying to his people. He said what he was saying. And then Ezekiel was to pick that up and say, oh, okay, that's what I'm supposed to say. But God said it himself blatantly. I say to my people, boom. And then the prophet says, oh, okay, and he goes and he tells. The voice is the voice of God that's been speaking since the garden. Thou shalt not eat, partake of this one tree. It's the same voice that is always spoken. Are you with me? And so that voice was spoken to the prophets of old. And then there was a prophet, the last prophet that spoke uh, on behalf of God through whom God spoke. And what was his name, the last prophet in the Old Testament? Somebody help me out. That's right. You would, you would think that it would be Malachi. Malachi being the last book of the Old Testament. But it's actually John. And John said, when they came to John, they said, who are you? You know, because John started preaching. He, dude's wearing camel's hair outfit, a big leather belt. I mean, he, he looked like Fred Flintstone, I suppose. Right? He, uh, what else did he do? He ate wild honey and locusts. That's what he was living on for this period of time. <laughs> yeah. He goes out into the wilderness and starts preaching to cactus or something. I don't know. 
But he's out in the wilderness. Because watch this. The Bible says, and all of Judea came out to where he was. Now, I'm going to tell you, you're a heck of a preacher when you're in the wilderness preaching by yourself and the whole town comes out to hear you. Or you look like a crazy man. Why did he dress like that? Does anybody know? I didn't really get this until I was reading my Through the Bible thing last week. Because that's, uh, that's how Elijah dressed. I thought that was really interesting. I didn't know that. But it said Elijah dressed like that. So he was, Jesus said, if you're willing to accept it, he's Elijah. How could he be Elijah when Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind 2,000 years prior? 3,000 years, 2,000. How could that be? It wasn't Elijah in the flesh. He was his own man. We know we don't believe in reincarnation. Y'all got that in here, right? I'm okay on that, right? Uh, no, because it's the voice. The voice. He was the same voice that spoke through the prophets of old. John was now the final voice of the old covenant that was going to speak. And when the, when the Pharisees came to him, because everybody was leaving them and going to him, and they said, who are you? Are you a light? Are you, they said, are, are you uh, the, the Messiah who is to come? He said, I am not. He said, let me clarify this. I am not the Messiah. They said, well, who are you? Are you one of the prophets? Are you Elijah? Who are you? He could have laid claim on any one of those and had a lot of power. But he didn't. He said, and I'm going to quote what he quoted from the book of Malachi and the book of Isaiah. He said, I am. Let me just stop right there. You need to know who you are. You need to be able to say, I am. Boom, 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 boom. I'm going to leave it alone let you leave it at that. But he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the paths of the Lord. This guy had gone out in the wilderness, started reading the scriptures. It, it, again, I said this three times already. I'm going to say it again. I just love it. He's reading the same Bible that you and I read as far as the law and the prophets, those that had been written up to that point. He's reading books of Moses. He's reading the different books of the Old Testament. He's out there, and he reads Malachi and Isaiah, and all of a sudden, he sees himself. And he said, I am. He sees it. I am. The, he's going to send a voice. Proclaim the way of the Lord, make, make level the mountains and the hills and clear everything out and prepare the way for the Messiah to come. And it dawns on him. That's who, that's me. I'm that guy. <clears throat> he looks down at his clothes. That's why I put this on. <laughs> it, but it dawns on him. He finds himself in the word of God. And if you are going to be able to say, I am, you're going to have to find yourself in the word of God. You're in there. Do you know you're in there? You're in there. And so John finds himself. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And Mark, John, Luke, all write about this guy. And Mark starts off with this. Do we have that? He says, let me turn over there. How am I doing on time? That was a long, lengthy introduction, wasn't it? So y'all not going to get the sermon today. I can see that. He says this. This is what Mark says. The beginning of the gospel. Think about that. This is where the gospel starts. Now, John is the Old Testament prophet. He's finishing the thing off. His message was to proclaim that there's one coming after him who's greater than him, who when he comes, he's going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit in fire. And Mark said, 
John's message was the beginning of the good news. Okay? This is where the good news started. Up to this point, the good news has been woven in and out. It's all there. The Old Testament speaks of Christ. It testifies of him. Uh, I like one word in the New Testament. It's the Old Testament uh, stories and things that took place were in samples. There's a new word for you. In, everybody say in sample. You know what that means? It means in sample. Yeah. It means examples. And they were in samples. They were examples of good things to come. They were pictures of what was Christ was going to do when he came. And so they're there, <clears throat> but nobody seemed to get it except the prophets who proclaimed it. And so the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So here's the deal. They prophesied that either you do right or you die or you're doing wrong and you get enough mercy that you turn around and now you get to live. But it's all action-based. It's all you doing and you acting and you being and you living right. Our punishment will come. And then the last of the prophets stands up and he begins to preach he begins to preach the good news. It's all climaxed. It's all culminates into this one man's voice because it's not his voice. It's the culmination of the voices that have spoken throughout the, the generations, throughout the centuries to bring us to the point of the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is not only Messiah, but that he is the Son of God himself. That's the good news. And this is where the good news began. What you are getting this morning is a Bible college course on what they call an Old Testament survey. Just an overview of what led, what God was doing to lead us to where we are today. And so in the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Behold, I send my messenger. Everybody say messenger. messenger. Me a messenger has a message. He speaks with a... <laughs> I'm trying to get the word voice out of y'all. Uh, and watch this. Behold, I send my messenger. This is what Isaiah said. I send my messenger before your face. And he's not talking about the people. He's talking about Jesus. He said, I'm sending my messenger before your face shows up. This is what he's talking about. It's the gospel. He said, before your face, who will prepare your way? We're talking about John the Baptist, right? The voice. Everybody say voice. voice. Of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. So here we're going to look at briefly John's message as I go through these in the next few verses and uh, wind this thing up. Watch this. Verse 4. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness. Here's John's message. He appeared. He showed up. They first saw him when, he, when he's preaching baptizing people in water unto repentance. So John's message is the same message of the guys of the Old Testament, right? Repent. And he baptizes them in water to symbolically show that if they truly repent, what they have done will be washed away, it will be forgotten, and now they will be on the path to follow Christ, okay? They can actually have their conscience clean for the first time. And so this is his message. A repentance for forgiveness of sins. Uh, the Baptists are great at preaching this. I grew up Southern Baptist. We need to preach it more. We need to talk about it. When you're dealing with and ministering to people in the world, there's only one message that you need to give them. And it's the message right here. That as the message began right here, this is the message. We can, get so, we can so complicate people, the, 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 the gospel by trying to tell people too much stuff they never really get the point. 
right? What I'm saying is this. The message they need is they're sinners. And we say that with love. But they know they are. You're not giving them a revelation. They know. The way I put it when I'm street witnessing or witnessing to somebody is I'll ask this question. Well, what do you do with your sin problem? I've never had anybody say, I don't have a sin problem. <laughs> well, what do you do with your sin problem? What do you mean? Well, I mean, we've all got stuff we, that we do that we know is not right morally. Don't you? Well, yeah. <laughs> so what do you do with that sin problem? Well, you know, I try to be a good guy. Has that worked for you? They need the same voice that started in, in the garden and on. They need to be told, yes, you have a sin nature. You have a sin problem. But the gospel, the good news is that Jesus came as the son of God and he bore our sins in his body on a cross. He bore the punishment for us. That's the message. That's really all we need to tell the lost. It's just that message. He wants to forgive your sins. And John came preaching repentance from sin and repentance and the forgiveness of sin. But he goes on and he says a few more things. <clears throat> Look down at verse 7. <clears throat> Excuse me, that was loud. Get a little choked up up here. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, after me comes one who is, who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. This is the difference. John came... Winding down, completing the voice's purpose in the Old Testament and to the lost to bring them to a point of understanding that they have a sin problem and they can't find God because of their sin problem. But he goes on and he winds up with this. He says, what I'm doing, I'm baptizing you with water and that's symbolism. But there's one coming after me. When he comes, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And if you look at Luke chapter 3, where the same verse is recorded in chapter 3 of Luke, but he goes on and says, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. And the fire there is, well, the Holy Spirit is the ability and the right to become holy in the eyes of God. That he will put his holiness upon us. And we will be righteous before God, which is something we can never accomplish ourselves, right? But we have a sin problem. And the Holy Spirit will come with fire, and he will cleanse us. Burn away all that the sin has brought in our life. You get a new start. Behold, all things pass away. All things become new. And that is the message of the gospel. And that's what you and I are to pick up and to proclaim from here. But it didn't stop there. There was one more voice that was going to show up. Look down at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came. <clears throat> are you glad about that? In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee... And he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, the same voice. This time it's coming from heaven because we're talking about the voice of God. And a voice came from heaven and said, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. First time the voice had said anything like that. Because only Jesus can God be well pleased with, period. Now watch. You and I can never do anything to please God except one thing. And that is to have faith that Christ 
paid for our sin, and then we come into him, and when God says to him, I'm well pleased with you, we're all, all down inside of him. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Did, I, did I lose anybody there? It's what he did that can make us pleasing in God's sight. How do we get there? What Hebrews says, for they that come to God must believe that he is and believe that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. So we've got to come to God by faith, believing he exists, believing if we will approach him and believe in him, that he will reward us. And that reward is forgiveness of sin, power and authority to reign in the kingdom today, to be prosperous overcomers in Christ. with an eternal destiny of heaven. Amen? Amen. I used to, used to know this preacher said, I'm preaching myself happy. Yeah. <laughs> is that Ken Cowan that says that? I think it is, yeah. Okay. Verse 14 is the last. last. 14 and 15, we're going to quit with this. Now, after John was arrested, context, we won't talk about it. John gets arrested. After John was arrested, watch what happens. Can you throw it up there? Jesus. <laughs> is it up there? No, after, oh, it is up there. I keep stopping at John. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee. Okay, now John's work is done. All the prophets of old are done. But the voice isn't done. The voice continues. The message doesn't change. It's still repent and turn to God from a wicked heart. It's still turn to God for your salvation, for forgiveness of sins. The message doesn't change. I mean, the message stays the same. The voice is the same voice, but there's a new revelation added to it. So watch this. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, and Jesus also was proclaiming the gospel or the good news. But this is what, he, this is what Jesus preaches. This is our New Testament message, Okay. Okay, so we don't go around and browbeating people by telling them they're sinners like we are. We do have to tell them that. But Jesus came saying, the time is fulfilled. Everything these guys said for 4,000 years was coming has now come. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now what? The Old Testament message is still in there. Repent and believe in the gospel. But there's a new revelation, and the new revelation is this. He said, the kingdom of God is at hand. What they had been told was coming now was standing in front of them, and that was Jesus. So the answer for our sin problem is that the thing is all fulfilled. The kingdom has come. We can enter the kingdom as king's kids. We're no longer peasants in the dark, lost, spiritually poor, broken, blind, deaf, have no idea what's going on in reality, spiritually speaking. But now we can enter into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of light, where we can see... The truth. Well, we can see for ourselves. We can be in the kingdom. We can enter in. And that's what we're supposed to be telling people today. So we're supposed to be a voice. The voice continues. I keep hearing that old Christmas song. And the song goes on. Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to hate that song. And the song goes on. The song. I was like, stop the song. That's what I keep hearing. It's really what that, that song is what this was talking about, was the voice that has continued to be spoken throughout 
all generations and will be until the, the, the culmination of all things. And he's going to take you and I out in a rapture before the tribulation. And if you disagree with that, fine. You stay through it and work that out. But I am gone. I'm going with you guys. I'm gone before it's over. I think it's funny that uh, our spirit-filled churches are so torn on that, it, even to this day, pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib. It will all pan out. I believe pan theory. I've heard that. All that stuff. Uh, but I, to me, it's very clear. But whatever you want to believe on that is fine. It has nothing to do with your salvation. That's the good part. just means you get your head cut off and I don't. <laughs> so, but uh, that's the, and so that's the gospel. We are, the, the baton has been passed to us. Yes. It will be a shame if we drop it. It has been handed to us. We're the last flank. We're the end of this thing. If we drop it right now, what a shame that all that God has done and spoken was going to come and going to happen, and then you and I don't do our part. You have a voice, and God wants to use it, and it's his voice. He, get this. He, what did he say to the disciples? He said, you're going to be taken before kings and great men, and, and you're going to be persecuted, and you're going to be, he said, but don't worry about it. I will put the word in your mouth, right? It's his voice, and he's been speaking, and he will speak. Amen. Praise the Lord. Stand up. Let's give the Lord a, a, a praise, would you? Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us. That don't sound too good, but that's pretty good, yeah. I guess there's just not a lot of us in here to, to make a joyful shout unto the Lord, is it? We're just tired and weak and lowly little people. Oh, as David said, oh, what a worm am I. No, you're not. We're not a worm, are we? We're full of the Spirit of God. We have been delivered. The kingdom has come, and God is here, and we are the carriers of his voice. And uh, we're going to go do that. Amen? Amen? All right. Lift your hands up to Jesus and thank him for his goodness. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Father, we thank you that we're a part of this huge plan that you began, uh, well, thousands of years ago. <laughs> And it's carried over to this time, and it's not changed. The message is the same. There's a new revelation. But, Father, we are in the age of grace where you're just so good and merciful and graceful to us to give us opportunity after opportunity to do and to say and to become all that you've called us into. Lord, we've been delivered out of, out of darkness into the marvelous light of the Son of his love. And, Father, we are, we're just ready to take this thing and run with it, Lord. I pray that you'd stir up in our hearts, Father, a hunger and a desire to see the world come to know Jesus, yes. to see the world hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, that's, that's what it's all about, and we want to have a part in that. We thank you, and I bless your name, Father. Bless these people, Father. Bless your sheep, all of us, Lord. We are your sheep, the sheep of your pasture. Come to, come to us, lead us, guide us. And uh, meet every need that we have, Father, because you care about us, and we expect you to. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I, I just bless your people. May the face of the Lord shine upon you, and may you be blessed in all that you do coming and going in and out. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. God bless you all. Let's throw our tears against the wall. <laughs>